be brave if you're brave I'll be brave but only if you're brave And it could be Just you and me We'll be family Just wait and see So I will fight if you'll fight Yeah, I will fight but only if you'll fight Oh, we can make it through this Like sailors in a tempest Like sailors in a tempest Together And it could be Just you and me We'll be family Just wait and see Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's uh, Lung Cancer Awareness Month version of the Lung Cancer Living Room. Thank you all for being here, everyone in the room, those of you joining us online. I hope you're sitting down somewhere cozy in your homes, uh, ready for a great evening tonight. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Danielle Hicks, and my role here at the foundation uh, is to oversee patient um, services, patient support programs, anything that has to do with touching the patient, from education programs like this all the way down to one-on-one uh, -on -one navigation. So um, welcome, welcome, welcome. We are so excited, excited to have you all here tonight. We're very excited um, to have Dr. Amy Moore, who most of you in the room know, some of you online may not not know. Amy is our director of science and research for GoTo, uh, and she'll tell you a little bit about who she is and why lung cancer matters to her. Uh, and then we've got um, Leah. I'm going to screw up your last name again. Crystal. Crystal. It's. I'm gonna, just going to say this because this is why I keep. Then I kept saying to Amy, I was like, is it a misspelling? <laughs> it's Crystal with. C H R I S T L, L. Yeah. and I'm like it makes me like want to do a hard stop. So thank you for helping me. I knew I was going to do that if I wasn't looking at my paper. Anyway, um, um, uh, Dr. Crystal is also um, here to talk to us tonight about our exciting topic. I think I didn't mention it, but um, it's talking about how drugs are developed and how they ultimately get to the patient, which is a little bit different than what we normally talk about. But I'm kind of excited to be able to let you guys understand what that process looks like, why it's important, and what role you can ultimately play in helping to get these drugs um, to uh, what we call the bedside or, or to the patient. So um, we are going to start with our around the room, but before we do that, I want to give a little bit um, of an announcement about Lung Cancer Awareness Month. It's been a crazy month. Um, a lot has gone on um, for us at GoTo, and I'm sure for you all as well. Um, but what I wanted to talk to you about is how you can participate. What does it mean to participate in Lung Cancer Awareness Month and how you can help generate awareness and be part of the bigger solution. So on our website, some of you may have already done it, some of you may not have. We have a, we have a toolkit um, that goes through some different opportunities and, and options for you to help. Um, it's our LCAM Action Center on the GoTo website. So if you go to the gotofoundation.org homepage and just scroll down, there's a banner um, um, that talks about committing today. And it gives you some of these options, and I'm just going to read through a couple of them. Some of them are daily action items, so every day we give you one idea on something you can do to help generate awareness, uh, so you can be on the lookout for that. You can attend an awareness event. I think we've talked in this room before about um, our Shine a Light program. Uh, and I don't think Katie's in the room. We, I can't remember how many we have going on around the country this year, but it's a, it's a couple few hundred, um, typically within um, a hospital 
uh, or a care center where there's an educational component. So it's something similar to a little mini kind of living room where patients can get together um, and, and learn and, and share their stories. So shine a light, there's a little link, there's maybe a shine a light near you, anybody here in the room or anybody watching online. So click that link and see if that's something you might want to participate in. Um, you can get social. We have graphics that you can share on social media. There's Katie. Katie, how many shine a lights do we have this year? We have uh, 140. 140. Participating in 36 states. Perfect, there you go. So 140 in 36 states, if anybody didn't hear that. Uh, so get sh social. You can share your story. We love to hear your sh stories. Other patients love to hear your stories. So feel free to do that. Um, know the facts. There's a little quiz on there. See how, how educated and smart you are about lung cancer and, and um, uh, take our quiz. You can fundraise and donate, obviously. And then one of the things you can do that I'm actually going to ask um, Ron to come up and give an example of is you can contact um, Congress and your local representatives. And Ron Fong, who's here tonight, um, has gotten some proclamations from the city of Fremont and the state assembly. And Thomas Greer, uh, who is a caregiver, um, his wife passed away a few years ago uh, from lung cancer in Arkansas, and he's working on, on, on doing it as well. He just reached out. So Ron, do you want to come up and just give a little bit of an explanation about what you did and how you did it? <laughs> so you too can ask your local assembly person or state senator to do a proclamation. Can you do this all this time? Oh, Mike, sorry. I just got a mic. You too can be a lung cancer advocate <laughs> by um, asking your local elective official to use some of your hard pay tax dollars to do a proclamation. So here, I asked um, the uh, State Assembly California Pro Tem, um, Kevin Mulvins, whose district this is, do a proclamation. And you get this amazing thing that comes out and talks about um, Lung Cancer Awareness Month is a, is a state recognized thing now because of this. I did the same thing with the uh, city of Fremont. And so we did this as well with the city of Fremont and then um, I got to say a few words and then so you reach an audience that you don't normally reach because um, at the city council meetings, it's a whole different people. They don't care about lung cancer at all, but they, they care that, you know, they have to listen to they get to the agenda stuff. So you get to do some of that, and that's what I did here. Um, Ron, what did it take for you to get in touch with them? What kind of conversation did you have to have? Where did you go? So um, with, with your elected officials, usually about four to six weeks before you want an event proclamation where you want them presented to you or you want it done, then um, you write to their office and ask them to, to, to do a resolution or a proclamation. And um, it doesn't cost you anything. And it's, it's, it's a great way to, to share the news about lung cancer to those who normally wouldn't pay attention to it. Um, you can do this at the elected officials at the congressional level as well. If you go to a town hall meeting um, with your elected official, they usually have town hall meetings, then you can go and stand up and say, I want to know what you're thinking about Assembly, um, Senate Bill, uh, House, House Resolution 2222, which is the Woman in Lung Cancer Research Act, and they can find out what they, but then you have a chance to spiel about lung cancer at that point. So there's different ways to get out there, and usually most of these events are recorded, so then you can download the tape and then share it later with others. Thanks, Ron. All right. So a couple of ways to get involved. Again, um, take the challenge, commit today, go to our website, and pick any one of those things um, if you have time and you feel so inclined. We'd love, love, love to have all of you be a part of it. We're going to go ahead and start with the Around the Rooms. Mike already mentioned. Um, uh, cell phones, if you have them, please silent them. And then don't forget uh, to grab a mic when you're making your introductions. And Michelle's online, so if, and David LaDuke is online as well. So if anybody online wants to say hello or, or give a shout out, uh, uh, please feel free. And Ina, I'm going to start with you. Don't forget the mic. <laughs> change it up. <laughs> I did, I know. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Um, it's really good to be here. I haven't been here in a couple of months. Um, I'm Ina Bauman. Um, I am coming up on five years uh, next month uh, post-diagnosis, which resulted, um, it was an accidental finding, so very early detection. I was able to have um, surgery, a full lobectomy, um, my, like one and a half lobes of my left lung are gone. And I've been sort of 
okay. And then last April, I had um, a new cancer, not a metastasis, also stage one, because of course I'm under surveillance. Um, I had stereotactic, on the right side, I had stereotactic radiation in May, and I actually have a scan on Thursday to see how you know, much prog what's progressing. Um, and it kind of knocked me for a bit of a loop to have the second one, you know. Um, but I'm very grateful um, that it was also early detection. And of course, that's key and a little becoming a passion of mine to try to educate about early detection. Thanks, Anna. I'm very similar to Ina um, in that I was an accidental discovery, very fortunate. Uh, it was discovered in June of 2018, so I'm a little over a year out, year and a half or so. And it was stage one. I also had a lobectomy. It was lower left, um, non-small cell EGFR. So that's one half of my story. The other half of my story is that my husband, Neil, uh, was diagnosed when he was stage four. That was 2011. And so it had metastasized. And uh, same thing, non-small cell, EGFR, he passed away in 2015. Uh, went through clinical trial, went through targeted therapy, went through chemo, uh, whole brain radiation, all of it. But finally in 2000, July of 2015. So I've been on both sides of the... Um, of the bed, so to speak. I've been in the bed myself having it, and then I was a caregiver as well. So it's a, um, like Ina, it's uh, early detection I know is key because if he were stage one when he was discovered, he'd probably still be here. But anyway, so, and thanks to um, the Go To Foundation for everything that they do. Thanks, Eddie. Hi, I'm Rick. I uh, was diagnosed in February of 2015 with. Uh, stage four adenocarcinoma. <clears throat> I was uh, a never smoker. I didn't have symptoms. Um, I'd gone in for a different ailment, and um, after having an x ray, they uh, saw the lump in my lung, and it had, um, it was stage four, so it had metastasized in my lymph nodes and my adrenal gland. Um, I didn't have any of the um, genetic mutation, so I went straight into chemo. Uh, I had to do that for initially eight months, and during that time, my lymph nodes and my uh, lung tumor were all reduced in size to where they couldn't detect them in the PET scans. But I did get progression in my adrenal gland, and since it was a single active tumor, they were able to surgically remove it after that, I went on uh, three or four more months of uh, follow-on chemo. But in 12 months after I was diagnosed in February of 2016, um, I had my first clean scan. And uh, they've been clean ever since. So I've been in remission, basically. Uh, no evidence of disease for three and a half years now. Um, um, I went through all the phases of uh, going on different um, disabilities and ultimately retiring. Um, I did have one complication a year after I stopped chemo. Um, I did end up getting a, a blood clot in my thigh, which was um, from some of the medications that I had been on and, and stopped after I wasn't on active uh, chemotherapy. Um, but now it's um, life's life's been pretty good. Retirement's not bad, and uh, um, I'm, I fill my days with with volunteering, and um, I go to other support groups. Um, ones at Stanford, um, a lung cancer specific support group, and then another one at Kaiser where I'm um, being treated. So that's about it. I should, thanks, Rick. I should mention, too, um, uh, for those people online, uh, also on the GoTo website, we have a, a, a list. It's a support group network around the country. So lung cancer-specific support groups that we are aware of um, are listed by state on our website. So if you're looking for a support group, lung cancer-specific, 
um, local to where you are, please check that out. And if you know of one that is not on there, please let us know so that we can uh, make sure to get the word out. Um, uh, uh, anyway, thank you. I just wanted to let everybody know that. Rick too. Rick too, yeah. So my name is Rick Meyer. I uh, was diagnosed in November of 14, stage four, non-small cell lung cancer. Elk positive is the driver. Um, I just passed my five years, November 7th. So very happy about that. Uh, things are pretty good. Um, I've been through four targeted meds. I'm currently on Brigotinib. Things are going fairly well. Um, just enjoying life, still doing some work, and um, spend a lot of time with family. Thanks, Ray. Hi, Larry. Hi, I'm Larry. Um, I was diagnosed in January of 2013, and my diagnosis was accidental. I had a cold and got some asthma symptoms and got treated for the asthma. And the doctor who was treating me said she wanted to get a chest x-ray. So the x-ray showed a spot on my right lung. And that led to CT, PET scan, biopsy, brain MRI. Anyway, stage four, adenocarcinoma non-small cell, um, EGFR mutation. I've done um, chemo, and now I'm on my second targeted therapy drug. Um, I've been on it for three years. Um, clear scans, I had a scan last week that was clear. Uh, brain MRIs have been good, and um, I'd like to keep coming to the living room and feeling well. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. You already talked, but you wanted to say who you are. <laughs> Hi. <clears throat> my name is Ron Fong. I'm a lung cancer advocate now. And um, on behalf of my wife, Joan, who was also in November of 2014, but she, uh, she's in a better place now. <laughs> um, I have Dragon Warrior hats. If anyone would like a hat for Lung Cancer Awareness Month, because uh, when you see this, there will spark conversations about why is it a dragon that's on here for fighting lung cancer? And it's because dragon is uh, pronounced in Chinese lung. So it's my uh, bicultural pun of lung warriors. <laughs> I love it. Thanks, Ron. I'm Frosty the Bear. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of us in white. <laughs> well, Frosty the Snowman, too. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of us in white for lung cancer awareness month. Um, I'm Sally in real life when I'm not a bear. And uh, <laughs> I entered uh, the International Early Lung Cancer Assessment Program back in 2004 because I was at very high risk to get lung cancer. My mother, her brother, my paternal grandfather all had it, and I had been a smoker, but I had quit quite a few years before. And I was watched. There were nodules on all my lobes, and uh, I was watched, and one of them grew. So I was very fortunate because of entering this program that I had surgery. My lower right lobe was removed. I was stage 1A, non-small cell adenocarcinoma, and it's 10 and a half years. They're still watching me because of the other nodules and my family history, but I'm a very lucky person, and I, too, am a big advocate of early detection. Thanks, Sally. Um, my name is Tina, and I guess November is quite a month because that's when I was diagnosed as well. Nine years ago on... Saturday. It'll be nine years. So I was uh, diagnosed with stage 3B um, adenocarcinoma, non small cell, with a metastasis to the lymph node, I guess. That was my first symptom, was a, a lump in my neck. And that was the only symptom I had, no other symptoms. But I did test positive for the EGFR. And so I was 
um, I did do chemo and radiation, and then as, I guess, as a, like a maintenance thing, after I had clear scans, after treatment, my doctor recommended, well, let's just do Tarceva for a year because we know it works, and so let's just do it for a year, and then it was another year and another year and another year, and I'm still on Tarceva, and um, yeah, it's all good. I'm not complaining, except for the frizzy hair, but. <laughs> I'm Tina's husband, Rick, and uh, <clears throat> December she has her 20-something, how many, 20, her scans, 20, oh, 24, 25 mm -hmm. scans that she's had over these last eight and a half years, and um, they've all, most of them have all been clear, and she tried to make her hair white tonight, but it didn't get totally white. <laughs> I'm Joanne, and I was diagnosed not in November, but September of 2016, and that was after a full year of being uh, misdiagnosed for a cough. I was treated for post-nasal drip, um, for heartburn, for potential allergies. <clears throat> Finally, a uh, chest x-ray showed that something was going on in my lung and all of the subsequent uh, follow-up. Somebody went through the whole litany over there, the PT, the CT, the MRI, <laughs> the, the biopsy, the, the, whole, the whole thing while you're scared to death. Um, turned out to be stage four uh, adenocarcinoma, non-small cell lung cancer, and it did test positive for EGFR. Uh, my metastases were to bone and a uh, small spot on an adrenal gland. Uh, about two months on Tarceva cut all of that way, way back. It was a remarkable response. I was on Tarceva at Stable for two years, uh, during which I did have an unusual side effect, scabs on my head that ended up falling off with all of my hair. My hair is back. <laughs> Um, at the uh, end of the two years of Tarceva, just toward the end of it, I became a part of a research um, project at Natera for blood biopsy for uh, detecting circulating tumor DNA to detect not the original cancer, but to detect progression. And uh, Right before the end of the two years on Tarceva, my tests showed a little uh, spike and uh, a subsequent garden test of that showed that it was T790M. And this was before a scan showed anything. The scan still showed okay. And so uh, with that particular uh, new mutation, Tigriso was the uh, the second line therapy, and just coincidentally, which doesn't have a lot to do with me, but it was at the same time that Tigriso became approved as first line. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, that didn't have to do with me. I'd already been on the Tarceva for two years, but changed to the Tigriso, and that's been a year ago, about 14 months ago, actually. And uh, so far, everything's still fine, and I'm still having the, the blood biopsies, and I actually have a scan coming up in December and the annual MRI, uh, um, yeah, MRI for brain mets, which I hadn't, have not had a problem with till now. So I'm very active. I've never felt sick, which is great. And I'm so happy to be part of a Dario go-to. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Joanne. I'm Joanne's husband, Ron. And uh, yes, yeah, she's very active. Uh, <laughs> But one thing I've noticed, there are several ladies sitting around the room who are all dressed in white. And I think that's, there's something that I don't know about. And she hasn't told me about this, but. Well, I don't know why exactly either. Um, we're we're going to learn, I guess, why we're here. They all got the same memo or whatever. Yeah, we did. Anyway, she's doing fine. Thanks, Ron. I don't know if there's, I don't know where Mike went. Um, Larry, will you pass to Wayne and Rebecca the, thank you. Hi, uh, my name's Wayne. Uh, this is my wife, Rebecca. And on Thursday, she will be a two-year survivor. 
uh, stage four survivor. She has mucinous adenocarcinoma, KRAS G12D, no PDL1 expression, and she's a non smoker. Um, only C. <laughs> no, not only C. <laughs> uh, she's gone through quite a bit of treatment chemo radiation, followed by Devalumab, then progressed, spent a year on carbo olympto avastin progressed, went to a clinical trial in Davis for about a month, and progressed. <laughs> and now we're on single agent gemcitabine, which is chemotherapy. Um, and that's it. And feeling better. And feeling much better. Oh, much better. Yeah, and uh, better. we have an odd case where her previous MRI actually thought, the neurologist thought that they had, she had new brain meds, but the day before her cyber knife, the technicians realized that all the parts that lit up were in the exact same parts where it was tre previously treated. So it was actually a false alarm, which was actually one of the best news we've had in a while. That's so great. actually that kind of stuff happens. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks guys. Hello, um, I'm Katarina, I'm a caregiver. I'm here for my mom, Ivica, who couldn't make it today. Uh, she was also a November diagnosis. I don't know if that's a coincidence that that keeps coming up. Um, she was diagnosed a year ago with stage four non-small cell lung cancer, also never a smoker. Uh, she has no genetic mutations um, and low PD-L1, 5%. Um, she had no symptoms, she had a cough she thought she got from my niece and the doctor uh, was very intuitive. Um, I think unlike the case with Joanne where you were just treated for a year for a cough, this doctor just said it sounded weird. Let's just do some scans. So that's how we found out. Um, she did five rounds of carbo keytruda and then four rounds of maintenance olympta keytruda had progression. So since, she, since July, she's been on the Nectar clinical trial, which is Opdivo and their drug. Um, She's kind of had progression on that. There's a lymph node that's growing, so we're looking at a new treatment option right now. So we're in the process of figuring that out. Thanks, Kat. Uh, my name is uh, Fred Palmer. I was uh, diagnosed with non-small cell lung cancer in October of 2013. Um, I was on immunotherapy for about a year, and uh, roughly a year and uh, a quarter. And then I uh, stopped it in September of 2018, and I'm stable so far. And I'm also involved in the clinical trial at Natera. Thanks, Fred. My name's Eric, and uh, I'm healthy. <laughs> and I'm an advocate and trying to help uh, all of you and uh, advocate for more research in lung cancer. Hi. Um, I'm talking tonight. Um, I have a fam oh, uh, my name is Solna. I have a family history of heart disease, and um, so the doctor suggested I have a chest scan, and that's when they saw a spot on my lung. Well, you get a spot on your lung, how do you treat it? Um, it was deep in the lung, and um, I went to see quite a number of consultants, physicians, and everyone wanted to treat it differently from radiation to um, lobe removal, it's because it's deep in the lung. Anyway, what, one thing that all the doctors agreed on is that there was no, to be no biopsy because of the high rate of false negatives. So right now I'm f just following it. It's been since 2012. It is growing, and there's no solid components, so that's good news. But um, hopefully by the time anything does grow, they'll have better treatments. Um, I'm really concerned that as more um, CT scans are being um, ordered and um, as the scans are getting better at picking up uh, more an an anomalies in the lung, um, the medical community really needs more guidance. Um, we're lucky we're in a very good area here, but what about other areas? And so I am an advocate, and I put my money where my mouth is, for more research for lung cancer. I really think that we have to spend much more to get better results. So. Um, my name's Ken, and I'm a caregiver, and my mom has EGFR. 
And uh, so she's uh, uh, doing okay. There's a little bit of growth now, so they're going to uh, recheck it with the biopsy. Yeah, but otherwise she's doing fine. Good. Thanks. Great. Hi, I'm Pat Pritchard. <clears throat> a year ago, November, I um, got sick of my allergies. I had been to Seattle where my daughter has a cat and I could not recover from the allergies. So went to the allergist, the lung doctor. I had infected sinuses, ears, everything. When it finally calmed down, um, they did a chest x-ray and noticed lumps. One on the left, one on the right. Later, biopsies, two different kinds of cancer. And the day I heard the word cancer was one year ago. So I'm not sure if this is a rebirth day or an anniversary, but I'm glad to have it. Mm -hmm. And. Anybody who is able to be lucky enough to be diagnosed early has a better chance. Um, I was recently scanned and nothing's growing, so I'm going on with my plans to go to the spa, go to the <laughs> go to Mexico, Machu Picchu. Yeah. Thanks, Pat. Hi. Good evening. Um, my name is Evangeline. And I was diagnosed March of 2017, stage four non-small cell lung cancer, adenocarcinoma, and I'm EGFR gene mutation positive. So after 19, um, I had cyber knife radiation in May of 2017 on my <clears throat> right brain because it has metastasized to my right brain and the left bone of my my skull. And so I had cyber night radiation that May of 2017 and started immediately on Terceva of May of 2017 uh -huh. too. And then after 19 months, I had another uh, growth. And so I went through blood work, the T17M. Two, two I, I did it twice and both failed. So the next resort was a biopsy. So the biopsy showed that I'm still EGFR positive. And now I started osimertinib, which is the griso, in April of this year. And after three months, I had MRI and CAT scan, so everything shrunk. The tumor on my lungs and my brain has shrunk, and on the left bone is stable. Then after three months again, which is last October, I had another MRI and everything, MRI and CAT scan, and there's no sign of metastasis and everything's stable. So. Um, according to my oncologist, I will, they will have to monitor me after three months again, which is January. So by the grace of God and more prayers, everything is under control. And I am blessed to be here in this foundation, which is my second family. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Evangeline. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Ren Long. Uh, I was diagnosed uh, in November the 10th, which is the same November, five years ago. I had a symptom about uh, five months before November. It's basically just coughing. <clears throat> no one, including myself, believed that I had a serious problem. Until October time frame, I said this coughing never disappear. I went to see a doctor. Uh, was kind of a, treated as a, some sort of allergy. So I get some kind of a, you know allergy medicine, but it doesn't seem to help. About three weeks after that, so I went back to the doctor. This time, I, I'm telling the doctor, it's a different doctor. I said, this is not allergy. Uh, I know it's not going to get better. That's my feeling. 
the coughing is just getting more often and more like uh, more serious. So the doctor started to think about maybe it's a stomach uh, reflex, uh, which is also a common thing causing coughing. And I was being given some um, prosalac, which can can suppress the acid in the stomach that might help with the coughing. <clears throat> but in the meantime, I was being told that uh, I did my previous x-ray about 10 years ago. I think the doctor said it would be safe, you know, would be okay to do another one just uh, in case. So I did x-ray uh, during that visit. But I was, uh, while I was driving on the way home, I get a phone call from the doctor asking me to go back and do a CT scan. So the x-ray definitely shows a big kind of white mess on my left lung. From that point on, so everything started kicking, all the procedures, CT scan, everything, uh, PET scan, um, biopsy, all those. So I was diagnosed later on, it's a stage 3B uh, non-small cell, it's a squamous cell, even though I'm a non-smoker at all. Anyway, uh, from that point, I was given a treat treatment procedure, three rounds of uh, regular chemo, uh, which used the cis planting and a gemis uh, gemicide. So uh, for any friend now who is uh, planning to do that chemo with a cis planting, later on, I realized that cis planting clinically that often cause patient uh, loss of a hearing, which happened to me. Um, I, I lost about my hearing, about 50% of that. Uh, I could, I should have done a base kind of a hearing test before I started my treatment. So that would give me a good, uh, good measurement about how much is this planting and causing that uh, loss of a hearing. So that would be something that I learned, but it's too late. So I didn't have a baseline of my hearing before my chemo started. But anyway, uh, that's a small price to pay it comparing with the result that three rounds of chemo shrunk my uh, tumor about 40%, at which point my surgeon can take me uh, to do the surgical procedure which I went through the left lung pneumonectomy. So I lost my half of my lung capacity. There are quite a bit of uh, impact to the life, but uh, compared with uh, the result that currently, I'm almost uh, five year. I'm still here with uh, no evidence of disease. I think uh, that's definitely a small price to pay. So I feel also very lucky and blessed and I've been participating in this uh, living room since then, and I really appreciate all the work that this foundation does, and also all the friends support everyone coming here or everybody online. Thank you, thank you everyone. Good luck. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rash Gobin, I usually don't talk. Um, my wife was diagnosed in 2013. She was EGFR, she passed away in 2017. Um, Kind of stayed away. Um, I kind of stayed away from the scene for a couple of years to get a break, but um, just you can't get away from it. Um, I recently started working for Garden Health, so one of my job is actually um, start a lab. Can't talk about where to um, be able to detect lung cancer early, because at this point the only way to get rid of it is to detect it early. Thanks, Rash. Um, thank you all for sharing. Jen, do you want to, um, there's a, sorry for the brief <laughs> interruption in the meeting, but if you give, you can give that to the back room and they can pass it amongst themselves and then there's one back here. If you want to give it, grab it, honey, and give it to this couch, that would be great. Thank you. Um, while they're doing that, so you guys might notice that somebody's missing from up here tonight. Um, Bonnie yeah. is not here tonight. Uh, since the gala, when some of you attended the gala and, and, and saw her there, the very next day she got on a plane and flew to Boston, 
for a meeting there, and then she was in Philly for meetings there, and she just got home last night. So she has not been home since the gala, and she is exhausted, mm -hmm. um, as you can imagine. And she sends all of her love to all of you uh, tonight, and is so, so sorry she can't be here, but she's uh, she's three hours ahead and jet lagged and, and all of that good stuff. I'm sure she's, she's online um, uh, watching and cheering us all on. So uh, that's, where, that's where Bonnie is tonight. Um, so with that, we're going to go into the program. I do want to give you guys um, a little bit of background on um, Dr. Crystal, who's here tonight. She's the Executive Director um, of Global and Regulatory and R&D Policy, JAPAC Lead and Global, formerly with the FDA and an expert on drug development. So really, um, we couldn't have anyone better here uh, coming to talk to us about what this drug development looks like, and how we ultimately get some of these amazing drugs uh, to you guys, the patients. But before we get into the sort of topic of tonight, I'm gonna ask you guys both to give us a little bit more background on who you are just as people and why lung cancer um, is important to you. So I don't know, Amy, if you wanna start and then we'll come back towards sure. me. Sure, um, so I am trained as a basic researcher. Uh, my PhD is actually in virology, so I worked on viruses before Moving into cancer research as a postdoc, I actually worked on leukemia, but then when I left the research bench, I became part of some statewide cancer initiatives in Georgia. So a lot of what I did there was focused on building infrastructure. So we helped recruit top cancer researchers to academic institutions throughout Georgia. We outfitted their laboratories, we funded them, and it was all with the goal of moving the needle and trying to improve patient outcomes, but it was still very abstract. Um, and so life brought me to California, and when I um, started looking for job opportunities, I happened to see the posting for the Dario Lung Cancer Foundation, and it was very similar to what I'd been doing in Georgia, just laser focused on lung cancer. And for me, the attraction was you know, everything I did in Georgia was abstract. I never touched the patient directly. And this has been the most fulfilling job I've had because I get to work with all of you. And it reinforces the urgency of what we do daily. Um, and all of our lives have been touched by cancer. My life has been touched by lung cancer. My um, uncle by marriage was just passed away earlier this year. He uh, was diagnosed as ALK positive and had a very short, um, run, unfortunately. One of my good friends from high school, her sister fought out positive lung cancer for, t for 10 years, um, you know, young, prime of her life. And so we, we all know the stories, we all know the people. And for me, this is, you know, something that's bigger than myself. And so I try to, every day come in, do I do to make a difference? And I'm, motivated by trying to equip and empower researchers with the tools they need to change lives. You know, ultimately it came down to the decision for me, you know, kind of doing that internal assessment, what did I want to do with my life? I said, I'm not gonna be the one who cures cancer, but I want to help those who will. And this is how I came to do that work. And so that's what I do every day. <laughs> Thanks, Amy. Okay. Um, my name is Leah Crystal. Um, I am also a scientist by training. Um, I'm a molecular microbiologist um, by education. Um, my, my mother tells stories. I was always that scientific person. Um, my favorite word was why. Um, <laughs> I did science experiments in my house in the bathroom cabinet and frightened my sister on multiple occasions. And I was just always one of those people who always wanted to know why, who wanted to look into how things worked, why they happened, what were the answers around things. So that's really been a guiding principle in my life. Um, so I went into uh, science. I originally did environmental research, um, working on hazardous waste degradation, trying to remove um, environmental contaminants that then can cause disease in humans um, and animals from the environment and, and you know, approached public health that way. Um, after I graduated from grad school, I worked at a university and taught classes and had my own lab. And then I had the opportunity come to me to go work for the Food and Drug Administration. So I said, why not? Something I didn't know how to do. And again, the other question of 
why and how and, and how can I help. Um, so I was at the Food and Drug Administration for a little over 16 years, um, working in various places um, within the FDA on drug development in, in different areas, beginning in over-the-counter drugs, and then ultimately moving into biological therapies, um, and then specializing in biosimilars, which I think we'll talk a little bit about mm -hmm. as well. Um, after 16 and a half years at FDA, I wanted to take that next step. Um, and then looked at working for a pharmaceutical company. So I went from being uh, in an environment of regulating drugs, reviewing them, helping to bring them to market, to then moving to a company that was developing those drugs. But my job in my company is focused on what's called shaping the regulatory policy environment. So as a formal regulator, I know how these organizations work. And so within my company, I am then advocating um, to help shape that regulatory environment to make it, make it more favorable for drugs to come to market, to have better understandings, to open up the pathways for things like innovative clinical trial designs and, and targeted therapies and be able to move that regulatory process with the science so that we can make, bring uh, more drugs to patients. And you asked the question earlier, why are we all wearing white? You can blame me. Um, <laughs> it was a small step for Lung Cancer Awareness Month, white being a color of lung cancer awareness. I thought it was something we could easily do to try to bring a little bit of visibility as a group, as this regular audience, to, to the message that we're bringing forward tonight. So, I'm sorry. Good but you still look handsome. You have the white hair. <laughs> um, I want to remind everybody, as we go through, it's meant to be interactive, so don't hesitate. Uh, to ask questions as we uh, go along. Just don't forget to grab your mic. That goes for those online too. Uh, like I said, Michelle and David are both uh, monitoring the two different live stream um, watching options. So type in your questions and uh, they will get them to us. And so with that, I'm going to jump into kind of, and you two as well, like if you want to like kind of go back and forth <laughs> with one another, I'd appreciate it too. Um, but look, walk us through the, just like a basic process for getting um, drugs from the bench to the bedside or from the lab to the patient. What does that process look like from a timeline perspective, from a, a cost mm -hmm. perspective? Okay, um, I could start. Feel free to jump in. Um, so it, there's really not a, a set timeline to, to bring drugs to the market. It really depends on the drug, the disease, what we know about it, um, if there's more fundamental research that needs to occur before candidates can be identified to then move forward. But um, a lot of studies show it's, it's anywhere from six to 12 years. Um, from that bench to the bedside to, to be able to bring drugs to patients. Um, but one of the important statistics to understand is that 12 to 14 percent of drugs in clinical trials make it to patients. They're the ones that get approved. So there's many, many candidates that don't make it through this whole process that we'll talk about. Um, so really, it's, it's only, again, that 12 to 14 percent. Um, it's an, an expensive proposition. <laughs> um, there's estimates that range from 1.5 billion to 2.6 billion uh, to develop a, a new drug and bring it to patients. So um, there's different ranges for different types of drugs, but for an innovative therapy, you know, it can be up on the high end range of that $2.6 um, billion to be looking at innovative therapy. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot that goes into it with that. So in terms of, of that development process of bringing a, a drug to patients from that bench to bedside, it does truly start at the bench. And, and again, it's what we know about the disease that's being targeted, what we know about the science, what we know about what's referred to as the mechanism of action. So how, how does that disease work? What's happening in the body? And from there, scientists can be in the lab and try to look for places where they can affect that process and identify candidates that can disrupt what's happening in the body in terms of that disease progression. So for oncology therapies, you know, we're looking for disrupting, you know, growth of tumors, you know, is there a way that we can cut off blood supply? Can we, you know, decrease replication? Can we, you know, what can we do to, to make sure that they're not hiding from the body's own immune system? Um, there's general therapies, as folks know, from chemotherapy that, that's systemic. 
we're now seeing a lot of advances into what are referred to as targeted therapies. And, and again, a lot of that comes from what we know about the disease. Um, the more we know about it, the more we can look at those targeted therapies. And, and so where you have in, in lung cancer, the, the EGFR, the ALK mutations, the KRAS mutations, to be able to look at that and say, well, what do we know about how that's different from some other mutation or where there isn't the mutation and to be able to then look for things that we can do in the laboratory to disrupt that process um, for those types of things. So there's a lot that's looked at in the lab. There's what we refer to as screening of candidates. They do that in the lab in um, you know, a, a non-clinical type of setting of looking at different cell lines um, that are grown where you can have cell lines that are taken from patients, um, you know, where, where tumors are removed and then those are grown up and, and tested um, in the laboratory. You can have cell lines that are made in the laboratory um, as well of, of trying to, to create um, what's referred to as tr transgenic Mm -hmm. um, models. Um, you start with a transgenic cell line and then you can look at, you know, testing and are there responses from those cells. So when you say cell line, mm -hmm. can you explain to people what you mean by a cell line? Like what, what is that? Right. So a cell line, so again, your, your body is made up of cells. Um, so for, you know, oncology, for, for cancer, your, your tumors are also made up of cells. And so within the laboratory, what they try to do is, is have those cells those individual cells and then be able to grow them so that they have material to work with um, in order to do that. And so they have to find the right conditions and once they do that to be able to grow them, they can keep these, um, you know, essentially cell lines growing to continue the testing in the lab and, and to continue their work that they're doing. Yeah. Some and, of you might be familiar with the book called The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, mm -hmm. who was a pa um, patient with cancer mm -hmm. and they, harvested cells from her and been able to propagate them kind of indefinitely in the research lab. So that's one of the things, you know, some cells are able to do that. Others are, you know, more primary. They don't, um, aren't able to be maintained in culture as long term, but we can do, you know, still some studies with them. So there are different types, you know, we typically grow them on dishes. Some are what, what we call adherent, so they stick to the dish. Others grow in suspension, so we have to know kind of the right um, formula, the right culture um, media to grow them in. Um, so they require different nutrients and things just like we do. So each cell line might be unique and specific and have very um, So there would be needs. cell lines specific to mutations, mm -hmm. to, did you have a, would you have a question, Rick? Okay. Just a quick question on that same subject. So in our bodies, the cell line mutates over time. So with your systems, when you do it in a laboratory, does it also mutate or are you good at replicating the exact same thing? Um, we're fairly good at replicating the same thing, but again, it, the, the, the trick of it is to understand how not to do that and how to keep it sort of where you want it to be. Mm -hmm. um, because if you don't give it the right growth conditions, the right media, the right temperature, other things, you can apply um, what's referred to as selective pressures um, that can then make them mutate. And so you don't want to do that. So you do have to watch that um, within the laboratory. Um, so there's a lot of techniques to do that, um, but, but it is you know, part of that, that tricky part of the process to be able to do that and to, to, to watch that. A lot of folks keep, there's, there's a difference between um, what's referred to as a master cell bank that then you know, are, are those original cells and then there's working cell banks. Um, and those are the ones that you're working with. So if you do accidentally do something um, or, and apply one of those selective pressures and you do see a mutation, you can hopefully go back to those master cells that you had that were unmutated and, and start over and, and still be able to have something to work with. I think there is a bit of an art form to it and there is great variability. We have a study through Alchemy, through the Adario Lung Cancer Medical Institute in partnership with the Ross Wonders to create both cell lines as well as PDX mouse models, which is another thing we can discuss momentarily. Mm -hmm. And it's not 100%. So we may you know, take a sample from a patient and we may be able to establish a cell line or a mouse model from it, and we may not. So there are a lot of variables that influence that, and some of it goes back to the biology of the particular mutation itself. Um, so you know, it's, it's, it's definitely a tricky yeah. business to create <laughs> these. Um, is your question more specific to like a, uh, can you 
Will the cells develop resistance mutations, or were you asking, will they just mutate out because they're not? Well, I was asking in general because one of the biggest problems with cancer is you may be in a situation where it's very well controlled, mm -hmm. but then it mutates either from a resistance right. or right. it mm -hmm. might mutate on its own anyway. So it was, it, it was kind of along those lines. Yeah. My one other question was when you started your conversation talking about drugs and billions of dollars, you said only like 18% ever made it to mm -hmm. market. Is it only 18% because of money, viability, the drug works, doesn't work, the drug is hazardous, you know, too much risk? What, what generally makes that number so small? Yeah, that 12 to 14% that makes it through clinical trials really has to do with the safety and effectiveness um, that you see um, as you're bringing that drug through development. Um, that, you know, there's a lot that are stopped early on um, due to safety issues because you're going from working with cells, you know, in a, a petri dish or some other type of thing, and then they might move into animal studies. And once you start to put it into a living system, um, it behaves differently. Um, and, and you might see safety concerns that are there, and so it stops there. Um, other things are stopped as they move into clinical trials in humans at, at different stages, um, you know, either due to safety issues or it's just not working well. It's not doing what, what folks thought that it would do. Thank you. I forgot where we were. <laughs> out, of, out, out of the lab. Oh, yeah. I think we have another yeah. question. Go ahead, Ron. Sorry. Um, thank you for doing research and getting drugs to the market faster. Um, my question relates to the fact that there are a lot of long-term survivors now, a lot more than there used to be, which is why we can have advocacy. But why are these people, why are these people surviving 5, 10, 12 years is there a long-term, is there a study of developing a model for, of why these people are different than the average? Like the long super responders. We the are, super responders, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, there are people who are interested in that. We've definitely discussed, you know, launching a study to look at that in partnership with some of our um, colleagues and scientists. Um, that is, you know, I think the million dollar question. Why do you, some people, why do we have super responders and why do we have kind of hyper progression, you know, for some patients? Um, we need to understand that. There's mm -hmm. still a lot of unknowns in immunotherapy, mm -hmm. I think, because um, it's still, you know, so new, relatively speaking, um, compared to some of the standard approaches like chemotherapy, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, it seems like a lot of our studies today are like throwing spaghetti in the wall and see what sticks. Yeah. We don't really know the mechanisms why, but we're trying different drugs and different tubes and or mice, and then they work or they mm -hmm. don't work. But we don't quite... It's not as focused as I think we could be, maybe. I think that there's a mix. Yeah. Um, and I think that we're becoming more and more focused over time. And I think it has to do with, and, and this gets a little bit into what folks can do as patients, that as we have these survivors, if you, as you have this body of evidence, you know, participating in that information collection, you know, that, that then allows researchers to say, well, why is it that, that somebody was that super responder or what was different? This is how we identified some of the different mutations over time. Right. And then from there, that can go back into the, the laboratory to say, well, you know, looking at targeted therapies there and not throwing the spaghetti at the wall, but actually, you know, looking for that more targeted therapy. Um, but, but there is is always a mix, I think. Um, I, I think, as I said, over time, we're getting more and more targeted about that, and you see progressions in a lot of the clinical trials that are happening that you see responders and non-responders and being able to pull those patients out and in real time understand better about why they're responding. You know, but that science needs to move with it. Um, I will say even with um, the mutations that we know of now, there's not great screening for patients a lot of times, you know, in areas that, that have very robust healthcare centers and healthcare systems, you see more targeted screening for those types of markers and those types of mutations. But as a general rule, you don't always see that. Um, and so you're missing treatment of patients, targeted treatment of patients that, that could respond to different therapies. And then they're moving through the system, their disease might progress. And that's also why you might see some folks that ultimately end up 
being diagnosed with um, a mutation but didn't receive targeted therapy early on um, and they are disease progressed and they're no longer going to respond in the same way. And so it's a mix of not just this development aspect but the treatment guidelines, the therapy as, as well as the testing yeah. early on with that diagnosis. Yeah, I would push back a little bit and say, you know, we can tell the story of, you know, the discovery of Javitinib back in 2004, you know, and it was kind of EGFR was something that was more highly expressed in non-small cell lung cancer. So we developed a drug, but, you know, we got mixed results. And it was only, you know, when we realized that the ones who responded the best were people that had a particular mutation, and then it got reapproved kind of for people with that specific mutation. I think over time, the science has improved as well. And so, you know, I would draw the um, point to the example of the latest RET inhibitors. You know, we had some kind of global RET inhibitors that were, you know, less effective when compared to, you know, like EGFR, TKIs, and others. But now with the two newer ones that have come, up, come online, um, you know, they're very specifically targeting we talk about the kind of there's a, a tree, so they're targeting a very specific part of the of that um, you know mutation or fusion. So the science is improving. Yes, we still have a long way to go, but I think we are making progress and not just always throwing spaghetti at the wall. I, I would say too that you might be that spaghetti, <laughs> <laughs> and so most there there is an underwhelming number of people who participate in clinical trials. Mm -hmm. So you need to be healthy, sick to participate in a clinical trial. You can't be really desperately sick because they won't accept you into the trial. So I would advocate that um, if you have lung cancer and you're healthy enough, you should consider a clinical trial because um, not only I think is it advancing the cause, but for yourself, you're getting much better monitoring than standard of care because they want to see how you're doing. Mm -hmm. So um, Joan and I, Joan did three phase one clinical trials and it's uh, kind of rewarding to see it now, several years later, um, they're now getting close to the marketplace. She was patient two cohort one on one of these trials. Mm -hmm. And it was like, wow. I think that's a nice segue into kind of an overview of what are the different phases. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very. I think you had a question before we drop Sorry. into clinical trials. No, go ahead. The 87% or so of drugs that never come to mm -hmm. market I'm guessing that somewhere in those clinical trials, someone actually did respond to those drugs. Do those people just get left behind? What happens? Um, I think what we're seeing more and more is, is folks who go through that data um, to look, were there responders and, and why is that? And can that development be repurposed into a more targeted therapy? But you have to look again at, at the safety profile that was associated with it. Sometimes even if you have somebody who's responding, the safety profile, the drug just overall is not favorable to move forward even with, with folks that respond. Um, but there are other mechanisms in place from a, a regulatory standpoint through the FDA. Um, you, you can have compassionate use, you can have um, emergency investigational new drug applications where somebody's just not responding to anything at all and wants access to an investigational drug. Um, you know, there, there are issues associated with that. Um, you know, for a, a company that's developing, there's, you know, safety concerns for the patients, things like that. But for folks who, who aren't responding at all and are just looking for anything and hoping, um, you know, there's, there's those pathways there to try to be able to push through. And so there, you know, that, that strong advocacy piece and being your own healthcare advocate and really trying to find someone to work with who can get you access to those mm -hmm. things, you know, to, to really, really push on those and, and be a loud voice in those places. Yeah, and I think a good example, some of you might remember Wells. He, he hasn't been to a, a, a living room in a while, but he was just at the gala last weekend. And Wells was on the ERESA trials, um, and then they kind of went, you know, by the wayside. But Wells has been on Iressa, Celebrex, and Maker's Mark, just so I get the, the <laughs> right, um, for some 16 years or something, right? And we know it's since been approved for long, but mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so he's an example of somebody who did get drug even after. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, great. So do they, um, do any of the trials, because obviously they want healthy sick, because they don't want their numbers skewed. Um, if a lot of people pass away on a given drug, it might skew their numbers like it's not great, but maybe they were gonna pass away anyway and the, you know, 
the drug wasn't necessarily helpful, but do they ever have a second group where it's more like the Hail Mary group, um, where they can get into, a person can get into a trial um, and it won't necessarily affect their statistics because they may not fit the criteria for your patient that we would like to take but it's still sort of like a Hail Mary pass, like something might work. Mm -hmm. Do they have any programs like that, or do you always have to meet all the criteria? Right, I, I can speak from a regulatory standpoint, mm -hmm. and then you, know, you, you can jump in otherwise. But from a, a regulatory standpoint, I, I wouldn't say that you know, that concept of healthy, healthy sick is, is strictly about not affecting numbers. It's, it's about sensitivity, in the clinical trial that the more um, comorbidities and comortalities that a patient has, the more difficult it is to identify is the drug working compared to either placebo, standard of care, or some other active comparator in, in that trial, that it's difficult to separate the factors that are happening and really focus on is the drug, the investigational drug doing something. And so that, that has a lot more to do with it in terms of the sensitivity of that clinical trial. Um, for folks who have to move off trial, um, because there's, there's rules governing clinical trials that are worked out with regulators ahead of time to protect the, the safety of patients and make sure that um, the, the trial isn't futile. They're stopping rules, other things that happen. So for patients who are in those trials who either aren't responding in a certain way or they, you know, they progress, something else happens, there are mechanisms in place to either move them to a different therapy, um, you know, do something else that's, that's there um, and help to, to support and maintain those patients within the clinical trials. So there are mechanisms to do that. So I don't know if you have. No, I, I mean, I think you covered it well. You know, there are just, the way the trials are structured, it is to protect patients and there are certain inclusion exclusion criteria and, you know, and a lot of it deals with what she talked about. So, um, but to Ron's point, you know, you are well served to explore clinical trial options simply because you're going to get, you know, better care, you know, at least standard of care, if not better. Um, so it is worth looking into, at least, um, in weighing all your options. Levy. I'm wondering, are drug companies starting to, or have they paid attention to the demographic of the people who are in the clinical trial? So, I mean, if you've just got all, you know, people of one race, uh, you know, mm -hmm. that could make a big difference because people yeah. with different ethnicities or racial makeup are going to respond differently. Mm -hmm. right. So how much are drug companies, do they pay a lot of mm -hmm. attention to that before mm -hmm. they're going to decide, well, I don't know, is this worth bringing to market? We only tried it out mm -hmm. on, you know, X population. Yeah, and mm -hmm. drug companies pay attention to that, but more... So importantly, I think regulators pay attention to that um, because in terms of looking at whether or not a drug can be approved, um, you know, they, they have to review the data and make a decision about, you know, what that drug could be approved for and be able to label that drug so that healthcare providers can choose whether or not that's the right drug for their patient. And so they have to be able to explain that you know, in writing, essentially, in the drug labeling to the, the healthcare provider. So they are, in order for them to make that approval decision uh, about how to label it to say, you know, is it for certain mutations or is it for, you know, a certain demographic or, or something else, all of that information comes out of the clinical trial. Um, there may be reasons to have it more narrow, um, but generally you try to keep the, the inclusion exclusion criteria from some of those, those true demographic standpoints of, you know, sex, gender, race, um, more open. And I would say that we're kind of regularly approached by companies who, you know, want to talk to us about how can we reach, you know, a diverse patient population. And so it is very much front of mind, I would say, for the companies and making it as diverse as possible. Does anybody else? Michelle, I want to pause really quick and make sure nobody online has any questions. Okay. Um, oh, Ron, sorry, I didn't see you. I, <clears throat> I, one of the things being on three phase one trials was that um, there's expense involved mm -hmm. for the patient, mm -hmm. and and um, in some trials, mm -hmm. it seems like the drug companies will help pay for patient expenses mm -hmm. um, that you might incur, uh, or even like 
just pay my parking ticket mm -hmm. to park at the place. <laughs> and, but it doesn't seem like it's in the budget. I mean, if we have $2 billion and we only got a couple hundred patients, it seems like we could do a little bit for it, help the patient expenses mm -hmm. out. That's yeah. my point. Yeah. Anybody else? So, so on that. Um, um, I, no, go ahead. Go ahead, Rick. Okay. I was on a uh, phase one trial for about two and a half years. Um, the experience was excellent. The drug was good. Um, they covered. They covered anything that my insurance wouldn't cover as far as scans, MRIs. I got them more frequent. I got them every two months instead of every three or four. Um, so the the care was absolutely excellent, and the drug worked really well for me. Um, it's. It's a drug that may or may not ever be approved because it overlaps with other drugs. Um, it has some advantages, but because of what it costs to get it to the finish line, they may or may not ever get there because there's other relatively comparable drugs, different side effects, you know, different people respond differently. So this drug worked great for me where electinib, which is a very similar drug practically killed me. I mean, I, I couldn't tolerate electinib, but I could tolerate X396. But they both fit in the same space. And um, I don't know if X396 will ever make it over the finish line, but um, you know, going through that trial was a great experience. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Rick. Kat. Minus the napkin. <laughs> <laughs> it is white. Hello. I don't know. It doesn't sound like it to me. Um, I think you're going to start discussing this, um, the differences between the phase one, two, and three. I think it would be good for the audience to kind of give an overview because we just had a two-hour meeting with the clinical trial department phase one at Stanford and learned a lot. Um, but I think definitely for people new to lung cancer, um, those terms don't really mean anything. And also, um, I know kind of for lay people, like this was what we thought you think that it's experimental, that you're immediately maybe placed into a placebo group. Do you really get the drug? So there's sort of some confusion. So I think you were going to go in that direction, but that would be helpful to kind of have that overview for the audience at large, because I think um, they're trying to fill in the blanks right now. Yep. Yeah. OK, yeah. good segue. So to continue with drug development, um, so moving from the, the bench, uh, the next stage is, is typically going to be animal studies. Um, so drugs are then. Uh, that, that are viable candidates to be able to move forward into further testing will typically be tested on animals first um, before moving into any sort of human trials. So looking for, mm -hmm. mostly for safety issues there from a, a short-term type of standpoint. There's also long-term animal studies that go on, usually, um, strangely enough, carcinogenicity studies, um, uh, other types of studies that would be from long-term exposure to understand that those continue through that, um, you know, the, the life cycle of developing a drug because those are more longer-term studies based on exposure. Um, but there are short-term, more acute types of animal studies of looking for immediate safety issues um, in terms of toxicity from exposure to the drugs before they're ever moved into humans. So once they have that data, again, if they think that it's viable to be moving forward into human trials, it then does then move into clinical trials. And so I'll just interject at that point, uh, again, with alchemy, we have a couple of animal um, projects going on to create both PDX, patient-derived xenograft models for EGFR, as well as ROS1 mutated lung cancer. So that's where patients can donate some of their leftover tissue or pleural effusion to create these models. And it fills an important need, as you heard. You, you've got to kind of go through these steps to get the drug from you know, the cells to the animals to then testing in humans. So um, you know, that's part of the, the pipeline and part of the, the need that we try to fulfill. Right, and with those animal studies as well, um, before starting clinical studies, you can look, start to, to get an idea of 
the, the dose that you would want to use, um, the amount of drug that you would want to use. So there's safety and tolerability studies, essentially, that they'll use higher doses and they, they see where they may get a response or may, maybe when you start to see safety issues and you could choose a few doses then based on what you're seeing in those studies to then move into clinical trials that you have some of that information. As science is progressing, you can actually get some early information about potential efficacy of the drug um, through these types of transgenic types uh, of, of animal models that you would have where you're taking cells from that lab and injecting them into animals and they develop disease and then you give them the drug and see do they respond or not respond. Um, so you could, it's not always predictive of the response in humans, but it can start to give you some information about the, the viability of that candidate moving forward, or is there something highly concerning there that you need to do more testing on before you ever look at human exposure. So once you, you pass those stages and you have something that you wanna move forward, and again, things don't work, things happen. So this is where you start to see, you know, candidates dropping off that, that leads you to that lower percentage, making it through that, that whole process. You move into the clinical testing phase. And so traditionally it's referred to as phase one, phase two, and phase three um, testing for, for clinical trials. And so phase one, is obviously the beginning. Um, and those are gonna be fairly small studies in humans. Um, typically, they are just with drug. It's not a, a placebo. It's not an active comparator. It's, it's not standard of care comparison. What you're doing is, is the first time that you're putting that drug in humans. And so you're looking at how humans respond to that. Sometimes phase one studies, depending on the drug, can actually be done in healthy subjects because you're looking at safety response um, in a lot of cases, not necessarily efficacy. So um, for some of the drugs, you can do that. For some drugs, you, you can't do that. Um, but you know, again, you're, you're looking for those types of responses. Typically in those phase one studies, you're looking not just for safety, but you're starting to look at exposure in the body, how that response is, is going. Um, if it's in patients, you might get a little early information about how they're responding to it from an efficacy standpoint, and then they choose the doses that then they wanna move forward into further clinical testing. Um, in the phase two studies, that's where we really start looking at the, the drug's efficacy um, as well as the side effects. These tend to be larger studies um, that are there. You're looking for circulation in the body, um, how that's working, are there any safety issues? There, you may or may not have a placebo control, an active comparator, or comparison to standard of care because you are looking at early efficacy information. So you'll have some, some more data that, that's there that's coming out of it. If things look favorable there, you then move into what's called phase three clinical testing. And these are what are referred to from a regulatory standpoint as well and adequate controlled clinical trials. And these are the, the trials that are the basis for approval. These are the safety, the pivotal safety and efficacy trials on which a, a regulator will make a decision about approving a drug. So this is really you know, where the, the rubber hits the road. Um, so these are gonna be large trials. These are always going to have some sort of a, a comparator with them um, in terms of either placebo controlled, active comparator, or standard of care of comparing the efficacy. So this is where you have the, what we talked about before with looking very carefully at inclusion, exclusion criteria. Um, you know, There's rules around those clinical trials about how they're run, what data is collected. There's a lot of inter face with the regulatory authorities globally as to what the endpoints are. What is gonna be your evaluation for efficacy? And that's referred to as the primary endpoint. And that's going to have to meet a certain standard. So to say that you saw within a certain percentage some sort of an improvement, either in comparison to placebo, standard of care, or some other drug. Um, you look at the safety profile. You can also have what are referred to as secondary endpoints. And this is where some of the information might come out about those <clears throat> subpopulations, folks that, that might respond in a, a different way, or if you're looking for um, folks that respond differently if they have a certain mutation. So those are those secondary endpoints. They won't meet that same type of statistical test all the time, but you wanna get data from those, those subpopulations as well. And that's why they're secondary endpoints. It's not a pass fail for that trial the way that 
primary endpoint is, but it's very important data. And sometimes if you fail on the primary endpoint, the information you get from those secondary endpoints shift your focus in terms of drug development, and then you develop new trials to be able to look at, well, who responded, and can we do a clinical trial for those responders then to then continue that drug development that's there. So I don't know if you have any other... You're doing great. <laughs> so, so I have a question. So, well, two questions, actually. So one, what are usually the timelines for, these, for each of these phases? How long typically does a phase one, phase two, and phase three trial take? Um, there's not necessarily set perfect set timelines for them because a lot of it is you're moving into phase two and phase three. It depends on the disease that you're studying and, and how long it might take disease to progress. If you're looking for overall response, if you're looking for progression-free survival, if you're looking for overall survival. So overall survival is certainly the, the longest endpoint. Um, and so that, that trial, if that's the endpoint, and that's typically what it is that you're looking at ultimately for oncology therapy is that can go on for a long time. In the oncology space, however, looking at overall response and progression-free survival and other types of endpoints can sometimes allow what's referred to as accelerated approval in the US. And that's based on an endpoint that wouldn't get you full approval, but they're seeing that there's response that's there, and so they want that drug to come to market to be able to be available to patients while they're collecting that other data about does it work or does it not work. And so a lot of the oncology therapies go through that process. So you're able then in a real world setting to, to treat more folks, you still have your clinical trial ongoing. And if you have accelerated approval based on what's referred to as a surrogate endpoint, so it's not for full approval, um, there's a requirement that they conduct confirmatory clinical studies um, to do that. And, and so there's a certain time frame that they're supposed to do it in there. We've seen that a decent amount in lung in the last few few years. Go ahead, Evie. I was going to ask is, and I don't know if the term bucket trial is the right mm -hmm. terminology, but that would really open up the marketplace, so to speak, of people that you could <coughs> recruit because it would they'd be treating the mutation yes. and it wouldn't matter if it were in the lung or in the pancreas or in the right. colon. Yeah. So you'd get a, is that the, yep, the kind of thinking that it's going towards now? Yeah, I don't know if you want to. No, uh, um, basket trials are, you know, kind of growing. In a bucket or basket? Basket. <laughs> okay. okay, not buckets. Baskets, buckets. Basket, you know, same thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on where you're from. Yeah. Uh, um, but no, those are kind of, you know, growing in importance and I think getting um, used more mm -hmm. consistently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's, there's multiple types of what we refer to as innovative clinical trial design. So again, mm -hmm. there's, you know, there's your traditional clinical trial. Um, but there's much more that's happening right now in terms of moving that clinical trial space forward, not just from a clinical standpoint, but using statistical methodologies of pulling data from other places, from other drugs, knowing more about biology, knowing more about the, the different mutations and how they're spread across the cancers yep. to say that you can create a different type of trial design, whether it's the basket trial, but there's different platforms that you can have for these, again, innovative clinical trial designs. And it's a, a really big area right now, not just for scientific activity, but for regulatory activity mm -hmm. as well. Because when you have those, it's so different than a traditional clinical trial that maybe a regulator is used to, that determining whether they met, met that statistical endpoint for the outcome to say that they could approve the drug, it's a different type of review that a regulator has to do as well. So there's learning that has to happen in the community as a whole. Um, within the regulators and the scientists who are reviewing those. And so we have people who are experts in those areas who are helping companies to do that, who are helping um, you know, academicians who are doing research, as well as regulators to train them to actually be able to review that data and, and you know, make sense of it to support and approval. I mean, I think that is partly, you know, the era we're in now and, you know, talking about precision medicine and we've seen the progress that we've made and kind of taking the former pie of lung cancer and carving it into smaller and smaller slivers based on the underlying mutation, underlying driver. And so, as you know, some of these mutations are pretty rare in you know, one to 2% of patients. And so, you know, we have to think about how do we build effective trials and when we're talking about an N of one type model and so that is part of the conversation as well you know as we get more and more kind of you know um, 
zeroed in on a particular patient subset, you know, there may not be a large patient population with which to work. Mm. Yeah, go ahead, Ina, and I think Kat has one too. Go ahead. Okay. I was just wondering, um, obviously there's so many companies, so many biotech companies, and if they have something that looks good, um, often they're acquired, of course, by a large pharmaceutical company. That seems to be the R&D seems to be outside of the actual, or the R seems to be outside of the company. Um, what happens to all the drugs that don't quite make it? They got maybe as far as they got because it, there was something that was, mm -hmm. you know, there, but at the end of the day, something happened and they didn't get approved. But, you know, it just seems like there's a huge pot of stuff out there that maybe would have some viability. Does anybody look at that ever? Yes, yes, okay. they do. Um, the, the, the NIH looks at that a lot. Um, the National Cancer Institute, NCI, looks at that a lot. Um, you know, research institutions, academicians, other folks will look at that, that concept of, of repurposing drugs mm -hmm. and looking at is there data and information that's there that, that tells them that they might be able to move forward with additional research um, that, that's done. So there's, there's a lot of candidates potentially to look at, yeah. um, but there are mm -hmm. folks who specifically focus on that. Kat? So we're really lucky because we're 10 minutes from Stanford, we're close to San Francisco, and I know the clinical trial my mom was on is offered at multiple institutions and you know we could travel. But what would you tell someone who lives in like Arkansas or Montana who doesn't have you know easy accessibility to a clinical trial? How do they embark on this process? Um, I know the clinicaltrials.gov website's there, but that mm -hmm. can be a little bit overwhelming. And I think there's also organizations that sometimes offer help, right, regarding expenses, travel and stuff. So do you just kind of have a general, I don't know, overview of what you would tell people that aren't as lucky as us here in the Bay Area? Well, I think that's part of the basis for us forming our care continuum centers of excellence is this recognition that 80% of patients, cancer patients, you know, don't live close to a major academic medical center. And so we need to provide resources and assistance to them. And so, you know, there was even, you know, a number of years ago, an effort by the National Cancer Institute to create these kind of community cancer centers. And so, um, you know, there's opportunity, I think, through that network, you know, to access some um, clinical trials. Uh, there are, and within our portfolio, you know, a growing number of kind of remote consent you know, sightless studies, if you will, where you can, we can ship a kit to you, you can, you know, donate your blood and it gets mailed in. And um, so there are kind of evolving models, but it is, you know, I think still a challenge. How can we bring these to, to patients wherever they are? Um, because it also not everybody have has a wider the diversity of ability, you know, the resources to, to access them. Um, so access is critically important. Yeah, access is important, and I think one of the challenges in talking with patients that you hear all the time, there is a tendency with wherever you're being treated, if they don't necessarily have a trial that suits you, mm -hmm. they don't really know who might have a different trial down the street, right? That happens in a lot of places. So GoTo has um, the lung match program, and um, we have, it, it, through our science and research department, uh, people on the other end of the line that will help you ask you a series of questions and then help you navigate or they'll navigate for you a clinicaltrials.gov to help um, kind of alleviate because that that in and of itself is a huge problem along with a lot of these other things that that Amy was you're talking. right even if there's a match it may not be available yeah and they're you know close to their home so how do we address that and I think but, that's but, a bigger conversation correct but I just want people to know that just because your physician, your treating physician doesn't have a trial for you doesn't mean there's right. not a trial mm -hmm. out there, right? <laughs> right? So it, 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 it's actually taking that extra yep. step yeah. outside of the institution you're being treated mm -hmm. in to look, and that's where lung match mm -hmm. can, can be helpful. Ron? Right. So lung match, can you talk a little bit more about that? Because that's like you recruit, you fill out all the enrollment forms once, but then you can do as you progress, or if you progress, you get multiple options to try different drugs. Am I understanding that correctly? So Lung Match is a program through GoTo. So we've got a couple of navigators actually out of our East Coast office, um, Andrew and Daniel, who work the Lung Match phones. So every day there's somebody on the other end of the line to help any patients be able to 
navigate the clinical trial system. So I think that's a little different than what you're talking about. So our lung match program will help um, help match patients to trials that they qualify for. And there's a second arm to it also where uh, patients who might not have access to uh, biomarker testing. Uh, we have a program uh, with, a, with another company that we work with to get access to patients to, to, this, the, to this biomarker testing. It's a company called Prothera. Right, but we talked about, you know, like the Ross Wonners, it crosses lung cancer and other types of cancer, uh. so we're working with that. But there are also other trials, I think, as I understand it, you enroll once um, in the trial and try arm A, let's say. There's like step-down arms is what you're saying. Or, right. Yeah. So then as you as you move, you have other arms. You don't have to fill out the paperwork again. You're automatically rolled into the Yeah, that's not necessarily element. what this is. This is really based on your particular information to help you know, show you what options are out there and, you know, not really to make treatment decisions for you, but to empower you with the knowledge and resources you need to initiate a dialogue with your treating physician. So you're not really signing up for the trial through us, but we're hoping to give you the tools you need to come up with an action plan and, you know, come up with, like Don, plan B, C, D, E, F, G, and on down the line. Um, so it's really about that conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask one more question, and then I want to jump into uh, biologics, generics, and biosimilars. Mm -hmm. um, but you mentioned placebo, and I've heard it mm -hmm. come up a couple of times. And I know, again, talking with patients, that is a yeah. mm -hmm. barrier to getting mm -hmm. pe people to enroll in clinical trials. How often does that actually happen in oncology, mm -hmm. um, if, if you know? And what does that really mean for the patient? Because I know that's a terrifying prospect. Yeah. yeah. I'll let you okay. start. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it doesn't happen very often in, in oncology trials. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's um, typically at least comparison to standard of care, mm -hmm. um, whatever that might be. Yeah. Um, so that's really the baseline for the oncology therapy. Um, you know, those clinical trials is going to be a comparison to standard of care. Um, depending on the, the drug and, and what that standard of, of care might be in relationship to that disease, it may be what's referred to as an active comparator. Um, of looking at where you have, again, products, multiple products in a class of therapy that, that you might be looking at, is that better? That helps also with treatment guidelines ultimately where you have um, you know, your, your, your first, second line, third line therapy of how you're moving through things based on how patients respond. And so it's important to have those active comparative trials to be able to understand that um, for placement, um, how do they compare to each other and where do you want to set your first line, second line therapy. And so over time, as you're in this space, you see things move from first line, second line, second line first, um, move around based on the, the data that's developed that's there. But it's very rare in the oncology setting to have a true placebo controlled study. But I think it is still very much a, a fear that people have yes. a misunderstanding perhaps based on a lot of <clears throat> bad things that occurred throughout history. You know, um, especially having been in Georgia, part of what we tried to do was to increase the number of cancer clinical trials available and to increase participation in those. And we had a high minority population, particularly in the more rural southern parts of the state. And that was a huge fear and stumbling block for minority patients um, because of the abuses that have been rendered on them historically. Um, and so trying to educate people and making them understand that you are at least getting standard of care, if not better. Um, but you can't, you know, turn the ship overnight, and you have to build that trust and earn that. Um, so, you know, it, it takes time. Abby, mm -hmm. and then Rick. Uh, I just wanted to say that I think that a lot of patients, when you use the term standard of care, we assume that they know what that means, and I don't think they, don't. they do. Yeah. Right. So that's really important mm -hmm. because if that were explained, then the whole idea of placebo it, that becomes a non-starter. Mm -hmm. Because you are getting care, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a really important point that doctors mm -hmm. need to explain. Mm -hmm. That's actually a really good point. That's actually a really good point. Thank you, Abby. Yeah, I didn't think about it that way. Great. When I did my trial, um, I thought it was required that they would tell you all of the details about the trial. And again, because it was for cancer, there was no placebo at all. Actually, what I was in 
everyone was getting the drug um, at a couple different doses because it was more of a dose study and an effectiveness study. Um, but it was my understanding that they would have to tell you not necessarily what you're getting, but what was in the trial. Like, it, we're going to do a study of 100 people, half are going to get drug X, half are going to get standard chemo or drug B, whatever. Um, but they would have to tell you what the criteria is, what, what you may end up with, not what you're going to get. Because mm -hmm. they want it to be blind, but they couldn't say, oh, you're going to go on this trial and we're not going to tell you anything about it. And you could end up with a placebo. Um, they actually lay out what's going to be in the trial. At least mine was. Yeah, and there are requirements for that um, in terms of what's referred to as informed consent. Um, so there are rules and requirements for all clinical trials, um, and that's overseen partially by the regulatory body, um, but then each institution will have a, a group of board that will oversee that um, as well in terms of what information has to be looked at. Um, the, the regulators, so FDA in the U.S., will look at the informed consent documents. Um, there's not everything that's shared um, because there, there's an, um, an influence risk as well about, you know, if you know so much, then you might impute as, as an individual um, how you think you should be responding or how you think you should be feeling. And that's why they don't tell you actually what you're getting. Is it, you know, standard of care? Is it the investigational drug? Is it something else? But they do have a, a legal requirement to actually tell you those aspects of the design of the trial. And you might be in one of two arms and this is, you know, sort of what to expect. And then also laying out, you know, if there's scans, if there's blood draws, how frequent those would be so that you understand going into the trial what your burden as a patient is going to be as well. But at least you know what the two arms are. Correct. You may not know which arm you're going to be in, but you do know what the two arms are. Yes. Yeah. And so sometimes when we throw around the, the phrase IRB, we're talking about the Institutional Review Board that, you know, approves these and is looking out for patient protections. Yeah. Wayne. Hi. Can you explain the concept of a crossover between two arms in a clinical trial? A crossover Cross between two arms in a clinical trial? Oftentimes I'll hear like there are two, two arms and X number of patients from one arm crossed over to the other arm. And what does that mean? with respect to the patient. Yeah, so essentially a, a crossover. So if you begin in, in one arm and you cross over to another one. So if you have two arms in a, a clinical trial where you have you know, your investigational drug in either standard of care or maybe a, another drug that it's being compared to, you'll have patients that will start out on one drug and after a certain period of time, they do what's called a crossover and they cross over into that other arm. Um, that a lot of times can, can be, again, based on something that you wanna know about the drug um, and how folks respond. If, if therapy is you start on one drug and then move to another, you have to collect that kind of information in, in real time so that you know how patients respond. Other times it has to do with maybe a limited number of patients um, that you can have in that. And so you have just a small patient pool to deal with. And so you have to do a crossover trial um, as well, um, just because you, you don't have other people to, to be able to test. There's requirements with that about um, you know, if, if you want separation of things, there's a certain amount of time that has to pass between when you got the first drug versus the second one to make sure that there's no overlap, um, things like that. But that's really what it means. Essentially, you're, you're truly doing, you're crossing over from one arm into another in a, in a given trial. Okay. So let's move on now <laughs> into these three different sort of types of drugs. Mm -hmm. So we've got the biologics, the generics, and then the biosimilars. Can you tell us a little bit about yep. those three? Okay. Different? So I'm going to take it up. Buckets. I'm yep. going to use buckets. Buckets. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> one, one more little one more Brackets, little level. Buckets, buckets, so, buckets. Yes. Yes. There are the, the three things that you talked about, but so there's sort of a, a layer above that. Um, and so you have what's referred to um, more traditionally as small molecule drugs. And then you have large molecule drugs, as people think of, of biological drugs. Um, folks used to refer to them as 
chemically synthesized drugs versus biological drugs, but we now have some small molecule drugs that aren't just chemically synthesized anymore because as science progresses, you, you see these changes. So now we refer to them as small molecule and then large molecule biological drugs. So small molecule drugs are in general chemically synthesized, so you can think about these things as things you might take every day, ibuprofen, aspirin, but then also your chemotherapy agents um, are all, um, for the most part, going to be chemically synthesized types of drugs um, that are there. They can, a lot of them are in tablet form. Um, there are some that are um, what are referred to as parenterals. They may be injected um, either through infusion or with a pre-filled syringe or, or using a vial and a syringe um, that would be injected. Um, regulators for better for worse, um, mostly globally sort of make a, a, a cut based on the size of the molecule a lot of times when they move then into that, that biological space. Um, so biological drugs are in general produced in a living system. So they're grown in cells. So um, I find the easiest way to explain this is in terms of actual beer and wine making. Alcohol's the, you know, <laughs> Great uh, Universal. unifier <laughs> of, of folks, and so since we're you know in wine country, we'll we'll talk about wine. So um, you know, folks know when when you're producing wine or even beer for that matter, you're you're actually that's a biological system. You're you're taking your raw materials and you're using yeast, and you put that all together, and the yeast actually um, creates a reaction in there and, and metabolizes the sugars and other things that are happening, and that's how you have the alcohol formation. That's a biological process. When you're making a drug in a biological process, you're you're taking cells, living cells, and you're growing them in a system, and you introduce into that cell. Um, DNA. So it's, it's, it's what it is that tells the cell what to do. Um, so you're putting that in there and you're actually programming that cell to make what you want it to make. And so this is called recombinant technology where you're, you're taking the DNA of that cell and you're inserting what you want it to do. You're giving it directions. And so as it grows and it divides, it's making what you want it to make through that growth process. And at the end of the day, um, once you have enough of that, you then take the cells, you break them open, and you get out the drug, uh, essentially. Um, so that's what's happening. There, if you've ever been to a microbrewery, you see behind the glass those big stainless steel fermenters. Actually, biotechnology, it's grown in the same type of fermenter. <laughs> so if you go to a, a, a biotech ma manufacturing facility, you'll see these large stainless steel fermenters because it's the same type of biological system that's, that's happening, that's there. Um, so that's the basis for, for biological drugs. Um, um, this is relatively new um, in, in terms of drug development. Um, so biological drugs, you, you have a lot of your chemotherapy agents, so things like uh, Avastin and Herceptin that, that folks would be um, familiar with, those are biological drugs. Um, also, vaccines are biological drugs. Those are grown in living cells as well. Um, you have blood and blood derivative products. Um, you have other immunotherapies. Um, so folks who have allergies, you might go get allergy shots. Um, those allergens are actually produced in biological systems as well. So there's a, a wide range of, of biological drugs that are there. So within these two spaces of having these uh, small molecule versus large molecule biological drugs, you have, for lack of a better term, copies of these products. And so folks are familiar with generic drugs. Um, you know, most prescriptions in the U.S. are now generic, um, where you get a prescription from your, your healthcare provider, you go to your pharmacy, and the pharmacist dispenses a generic drug. It's not the brand name drug. It's, it's a, you know, a copy version of that drug, for lack of a better phrase. Until 2010, there was no pathway, regulatory pathway in the US to have copy versions of biological products. So for biological products, it was what was referred to as a single source market. There was one person, one company that made one drug. And that was the only availability that was there. 
So in 2010, um, there was a law that was implemented that, that Congress had created um, called the Biologics Price Competition and Innovation Act. And it was the first time in the US that there was a pathway to make copy versions of biological products. And it had the same purpose as the generic pathway um, to have more than one product of, of the same type in the marketplace to create competition um, to, and through that competition to reduce cost healthcare cost, and hopefully with having more products on the market, potentially increase access to patients as well. Um, and so those drugs are called biosimilars. They're called biosimilars because in a biological system, I think was mentioned, they're highly variable. And so they can't be identical copies the same way that you can have an identical copy of something that's chemically produced. So they're called biosimilars because they're, they're not exact copies, but there are standards there about how close they have to be in terms of their structure and then also how it is that they work, that safety and efficacy profile that we talked about. So again, the best way to explain this, all things come back to alcohol. Um, so, well, let's see, I saw people up here drinking some, some a nice glass of red wine, so yeah. we'll mm -hmm. choose Cabernet, partially because I'm partial to it. But um, so everybody knows all Cabernets are not the same. So if I make a Cabernet and you want to make a biosimilar to my Cabernet, you as a biosimilar manufacturer buy my Cabernet and take it apart. You test it in the laboratory, you take it apart, you try to figure out where I get my grapes from, what are my soil conditions, um, do I only work in a stainless steel fermenter, do I put them in oak barrels, if I do, for how long? So you test my wine and you try to take it apart and try to figure out how I make that, everything about it and how I make that. And then you, as a biosimilar manufacturer, start to make your own wine and then you test it in small amounts and you look at how similar it is, how similar it is on that for biological products on that structural and functional level. So what does it look like and how is it working? And you do that through tests and that's where you get that, what's referred to as being highly similar. So again, it can't be identical because it's variable in a biological system, but it has to be what's called highly similar in structure and function. So it has to have that same, type of, of, of structure um, in terms of what it looks like, but then also the function of how it works. What is its biological activity and how it works in the body? So once you know that, you then make a little bit more of your drug, still comparing it to mine, and then you start looking at it in clinical trials. So unlike an innovative drug where you have this phase one, phase two, phase three, what you do for a biosimilar is you have what's called a comparative clinical study. So you as the biosimilar manufacturer take your proposed biosimilar and my wine, put them in the trial together. One arm is on mine, one arm is on hers. And you look at how the patients respond. Do they have the same clinical outcomes? Is the safety profile the same? Do they respond in the same way? So you're looking again at that comparative safety and efficacy. So it's not compared to standard of care. These are all active comparative trials to say, do they work the same? In the US, the regulatory standard is called no clinically meaningful differences. And so again, it's expected to have the same clinical performance at the end of the day is that is my product, my innovative product that's there. And so if all of that lines up, they bring that data to the FDA and say, I took it all apart, it looks the same, it acts the same in as much as I can for, for a biological product, and I looked at it in humans and it has the same safety and efficacy profile. And if all of that lines up, then FDA will approve that product as a biosimilar ultimately that will come to market. And so we've had recent in the oncology space, some biosimilars that have recently launched um, in the oncology space. And so we're starting to see these moving into the marketplace and creating competition, which again will hopefully drive down cost um, because obviously oncology therapy is a very costly endeavor. So the whole point of this pathway is to have more products that are competing in the marketplace, and we know in, in that, that type of, of system that you have then, then cost competition, so hopefully to drive down cost, and then ultimately um, potentially increase access for patients as well. 
So two questions. One, what in particular might, in what areas might this be happening in lung? Mm -hmm. And then two, if cost is an issue for patients, would it be beneficial for those patients to go back and speak with their physicians about whether or not mm -hmm. there was an option for a cheaper version for, to keep it simple, of this drug that could would work the same. Right, so we have had um, recent approvals for biosimilars to Avastin, mm -hmm. um, which is obviously going to impact in, in the, the lung cancer space. Mm -hmm. um, there are other oncology therapies that are being looked at potentially um, for development that, that would impact in the lung cancer space as well. But right now we do have approvals for biosimilars to Avastin in particular right. in the US and those are starting to come to market. And so we're starting to see that market dynamic change as, as we're having that competition. Um, for patients, again, if you're on a therapy and as you're aware of these biosimilars coming to market, um, the FDA does maintain a web page um, that lists out all of the approvals. Um, it's something that advocacy organizations can link to as a resource um, for their their own stakeholders to be providing that information. And every time FDA approves a new biosimilar, they do post that on there. So it's a resource that, that can then come through an advocacy organization to be looking at that. It is a good conversation to have with your physician to go back. Um, everyone's um, healthcare plans are going to be different. And right now, biosimilars are, are new to the U.S. marketplace. Um, payers are looking at how they're going to, to incorporate them into formularies and what that's going to look like. Um, so it's important not only to talk to your physician, but then also to understand for your own health care plan what that would look like and is it going to be of benefit to you based on what would be available and then how that would be reimbursed. But it is a conversation that, that should be had. Right. So what does it typically cost for a company to do a biosimilar in comparison to a company doing a startup from scratch? It's gotta be significantly different. It is significantly different and it's significantly less. Um, so not to, to be overly complicated about a very complicated subject, but in terms of those clinical trials that we talked about, for an innovative product, the, the typical standard for uh, approval is an expectation of two adequate and well-controlled clinical trials for each indication for which approval is sought. Um, in the oncology space, a lot of times it might be one trial just because of the drug that's there, and, and we talked about that accelerated approval process, so it can be a little bit different. For a biosimilar though, you can have this comparative clinical study that's run of looking at the comparison of safety and efficacy in maybe one patient population. Um, so if there's multiple um, cancers that are approved for a drug, such as like Avastin, they might study in breast cancer or colon cancer or you know, something that's there and then say it works the same and then they could be approved for all of the indications, all of the, the different cancers for which um, that innovative product is approved and they don't have to do trials in every patient population that's there and that's a huge cost savings um, as a part of that, that development process. Ron, is, oh, go ahead Rick. Is there a time frame between, you know, the original company has patents or whatever, is there some time frame involved in yeah. when the second company can start? Yeah, yeah. so that. there's there's two things that factor into that. There's the, the patent landscape, and then there's what's referred to as regulatory exclusivity. So as a part of that law that I spoke about, um, uh, innovative or originator um, <laughs> biological products receive what's called tw uh, 12 years of regulatory exclusivity. So for the FDA, they can't accept a marketing application for a biosimilar to a biological product for four years after that initial approval date of that originator product, and they can't approve a biosimilar for 12 years until after that, that originator product was originally approved. Um, patents are different, um, and there's different patent terms that happen that's outside of what FDA does in terms of looking at when they could approve something, and that does uh, a lot of times um, impact on when, even if a product is approved, when it can ultimately come to market based on what patents are, are held by the innovative company. Yeah, Ron? Could you speak a little bit about, um, many people online will argue that they can't afford their, whatever the drug is that they're looking at, but there are um, similars in other nations mm -hmm. where the cost is much less. Talk about that that pathway maybe. Mm -hmm. 
So um, I am not a drug importation expert by any stretch of the imagination, <laughs> so I'm going to, to, to preface this. Um, you know, there, there is a lot of conversation about drug importation in the U.S. It's something that, that the administration is looking at, Congress is talking about, individual states are looking at um, to be able to do that. Um, as a formal regulator at FDA, you know, there, there's certainly concern about, you know, protecting patient safety in that space. Um, you know, not all healthcare systems, you know, globally are, are set up the same way. And so, you know, there, there has to be protections for patients to make sure, um, you know, what is, is, is coming in if, if that's something that the U.S. ultimately decides to do is truly the drug that, that patients think that it is. Um, and that uh, for biological products, they're very sensitive um, to temperature, to light, um, to agitation. Um, a lot of uh, biological products, if they're shaken, they can form what's called aggregates. And when you try to infuse them, it can cause a lot of problems um, for the patient in terms of an immunologic response, um, but then also you, you can have um, blockages and other things that, that would occur. And so you want to make sure that in that transit, other things that might happen, that you're protecting patient safety. So there's, there's you know, a, a lot of concern about it, but there's also focus, as folks know, about reducing health care costs in the U.S. just through other prices mechanisms and, and things that are there. So, you know, clearly it, it's a conversation that needs to be had, not just by the administration, um, but, you know, by all of us as well about being advocates to be able to to look at, at how to tackle health care costs. Larry. Just uh, how about not duplicating drugs, but new drugs from outside the United States? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, I mean, there, there are differences in, in terms of what regulators look at to, to be able to approve something. And, and um, there may be drugs that are approved in, in different places based on different standards. Um, and again, that, that's where, you know, there has to be a careful look at what those standards are um, and, and having access to that and, and having, you know, programs to be able to access maybe those products. As I said, we have um, programs in the U.S., things like compassionate use and, and other types of things. Um, that, that are available to access drugs that are under investigation um, in the U.S. Um, Ex-U.S. starts to, to, to raise different questions um, that are there. Um, you know, but again, I think it's a conversation that, that's ripe to have in, in this day and age, in this environment, uh, about looking at opportunities you know, when, when folks aren't responding to other therapies and what their choices are, but then also you know, tackling the, the issue of health care costs in, in the U.S. And, and having those innovative therapies. Um, available. Go ahead, Kat. Um, I just have a quick question. Do either of you have a wish list of what you think, what you would like to change in this space, in the clinical trial space? Like you just wish that yes, it was a different... there's a wish list. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot. No, I mean, I think, you know, we've touched on a lot of the, the issues of cost, access, um, you know, innovative trial design, you know, there's lots of still room for improvement, even though pro progress is being made. Um, I think we all wish we could get, you know, better drugs developed faster um, and get them to patients. So, you know, but how do we go about that? I mean, I don't pretend to be the expert in that arena, but, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think from my standpoint, um, I'm, I'm a, a big communication person, and you know, when, when I was at FDA and working on biosimilars, um, you know, we had an internal facing component, but an external facing component, and being able to to figure out how how people needed to get information, and at, at, at FDA, how we interfaced with with patient advocacy organizations, and and what we could do in terms of communication, and and helping to empower patients to be the best healthcare advocates for themselves that they could. Um, you know, and having a family member or, or someone else, it's a complicated space. So, you know, my wish list always is to, to be able to develop those tools. Um, mm -hmm. I, I do that at my company now as well to help support that, um, to, to give people the information that they need um, to really navigate this space. And so that's, that's really my wish list is to have more transparency. Mm -hmm. So this has been great. We've got like 34 seconds left um, in our time. Thank you all so much for all your questions and keeping this really interactive. And of course, a huge thank you to Leah and Amy for coming out tonight um, and chatting with us about this very important topic. Um, 
I want to um, um, thank also Penn TV as usual for coming in here. Um, there's nobody new in the room tonight except for um, Dr. Crystal, of course, but um, they come in every month and they set up. There's a whole studio in the back. I don't know if you got a chance to see it. If you didn't, yeah. you have to check out what's going on back there. They set all of this stuff up um, and then they play it on local cable uh, all month long for us. So huge thank you to Penn TV for all their hard work um, month after month. Thank you to the Office Bar and Grill for donating all the food tonight. Um, thank you to the GoTo team. Um, I think... Kim left, but Kim, um, uh, Michelle, Leah, I know Jen was here tonight. Those of you who were able to stay tonight, obviously Amy, um, part of that go-to team as well. And a huge thank you to our supporters, um, whom without their support, we wouldn't be able to bring this to you. So thank you to Abby, Amgen, AstraZeneca, Bear, Bowringer Ingelheim, Bristol Myers Squibb, Cell Jean, Daichi Senkyo, is that how you say it? Daichi. Daichi. Mm -hmm. um, I always screw that up too. So Dignity Health, Foundation Medicine, Genentech, Lily, Merck, Novartis, Takeda, and Tesaro. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all your support. And um, last but most definitely not least and always first to the patients. Thank you all for coming out, for sharing your stories uh, month after month um, with all of these people out in uh, in the on the great uh, in the great wide web and on TV. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, you are why we do this. Thank you to Sally. You brought dessert, right? For dressing like a bear. Who brought? Who, Ina brought dessert. <laughs> Ina brought dessert this month. Thank you to Ina for bringing dessert. Um, please come check out the dessert table. Um, and I will see you guys all next month. Next month, just as a reminder, is our holiday celebration. So we'll be doing patient round table and then celebrating with a big holiday meal. Um, um, so looking forward to seeing you all then. Thanks everybody. Come check out the props. They're pretty cool. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. See them up close. Thank you so much. Oh my God. Oh, I'll be brave if you're brave. I'll be brave, but only if you're brave. And it could be just you and me. We'll be family. Just wait and see. So I will fight if you'll fight Yeah, I will fight but only if you'll fight Oh, we can make it through this Like sailors in a tempest Like sailors in a tempest Together and it could be just you and me will be family just wait and see